Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to the World Skills Leaders Forum 2011, held in conjunction with the 41st World Skills Competition here in the fantastic city of London. Of course, I am biased. If I haven't met you before, my name is Nadine DeRazer, and I'm a business presenter, and over the years I've worked for a variety of publications and broadcasters, including Sky TV, CNN, and the FT, and I've also chaired and facilitated numerous conferences all around the world for a variety of different sectors. And over the last two years, it's been a great privilege to sit on the board of World Skills London 2011. And I don't know about you, when I saw the competition yesterday, a little tear did come to the eye. The sheer scale and the complexity of putting an event on like this, which I'd seen before in Calgary two years previously, still overwhelming. And I hope if you haven't seen the competition yet, you'll get that same sense of pride, particularly when we saw those wonderful primary school children in yesterday. And I'm really looking forward to chairing the forum today, which really does bring together some of the world's influential thinkers and policymakers of international skills ever held, including ministers, we've got corporate chief execs, senior civil servants, and world-class educationists from every single corner of the globe. So wherever you've traveled from, a very warm welcome to all of you. Now, the World Skills Leaders Forum is supported by World Skills International Global Industry Partners in partnership with City and Guild. So I'd like to say thank you to you as well. And this forum is an annual global event aiming really to make the most of the World Skills International Global Network to meet the needs of industry and commerce and those who train them to the mutual benefit of all those concerned. And as well as being a great networking event, which you could see out there, everybody was busy chatting, hence we started slightly late, the forum should provide you with, I hope, some really practical information to take away. And I urge all the speakers taking part and all those asking questions as well, not just to inform this very sophisticated and attractive audience, of course, but I'm also looking for examples of transformational success and skills, policy and practice. I want real evidence of innovation, impact and return on investment. And as a result of being here today, I'm sure you'd like to find out what you can do to help your business, your people, your countries to get the skills they need for now and in the future to really drive that economic and business success. Now we have a fair amount to get through today, so timekeeping is of the essence, she says, um, which is really a hint to the speakers taking part not to go over their time allocated. And to assist in the smooth running of the day, could you please now check that your phones and your other electronic devices are switched off or on silent? Now, the catalyst behind the theme and direction for this year's World Leaders Forum was the Harvard Graduate School of Education report entitled Pathways to Prosperity. And this morning's presentation will primarily focus on the UK, and then this afternoon we'll have a more global perspective, and we've carefully selected a mix of developed and developing countries from all around the world to address the impact and vocational training has on economic growth. Now, following on from the presentations, we have two panel discussions scheduled in, one put in place just before lunch, and then the one towards the close of play as well. At some point during the panel discussions, I will be going to the audience to invite questions as well, and I'll go through the format of the Q&A later on. So let's get the program underway, and I'm delighted to say to give the opening address, we have the Mayor of Newham here to formally welcome you to World Skills Leaders Forum, as well as obviously the event as well. And as elected Mayor of Newham, Sir Robin Wells has been instrumental in leading the council to become a center of excellence and getting people in to sustainable employment. Robin is a board member of the London Organising Committee of the Olympic Games, otherwise known as LOCOG, and he also serves on the board of the Olympic Park Legacy Company. So please give a very warm welcome to the Mayor of Newham, Sir Robin Wales. Good morning, Sir Robin. I see you. Good morning to you. Morning. Oh, good. I just want to check you were awake after drinking all last night. I figure that's, that's, yeah, that's what people normally do. Uh, welcome to World Skills. Welcome to Newham. Uh, perhaps if I explain Newham, Newham is about 300,000 people. It's the most ethnically diverse place on the face of the planet. So wherever you're from, we've almost certainly got a community here who are happy to welcome you. Uh, interesting, uh, even though it's the most diverse place, 86% um, of people say we get on well together. So it's a place where people get on well from all over the world. And indeed, when we ask whether they're British or not, 
we score 1% higher than the rest of England in terms of being British. So even though we're, we're from all parts of the world, um, even from Scotland, we are... Uh, as it, yeah, no, so you, so you don't recognise my accent, do you? I need, I need to do a, a do what Governor Aishu Coco accent, you know, like Dick Van Dyke, to ensure I'm from East End. The other thing we are is very young. We're the second youngest place uh, in Europe, and we are the borough next to Walford. Now, I'm just checking to see Walford. Anybody watch East Enders? Put your hand up if you watched East Enders. Yeah, oh God. I wouldn't bother if I were you. It's a terrible programme. Now, I'm really pleased to come here today because I think this is a, an area which historically has been a place where skilled workers have worked and created the wealth of our country. You're, you're right next to the Royal Docks, which is the largest man-made docks in the world and was the beating heart of the British Empire. Skilled workers unloading cargoes and keeping the docks running. And, and This was the heart of our country. Uh, things moved on, people were made redundant, but things are changing again. We're now a major business location. Many of you will have seen that Westfield Stratford has recently opened, the largest urban shopping mall in Europe. Uh, we have here in the docks where you're sitting, we have an enterprise zone. We have this fantastic facility in Excel, the best international conference center in the world. We believe that. I'm sure you agree with that. You'd all agree with that, wouldn't you? Yeah, I'm just checking, just making sure you agree. Um, and we've got Siemens building, thing, and people are beginning. So people are coming because there's vast acres of land here to be developed with fantastic transport facilities. The other thing we've got, we are the main host borough for the Olympic Games. Most of the park is in the, the uh, is in this borough, and this XL is a major venue for the games. There will be more medals given out here than will be given out on the Olympic Park. So we're looking for the Olympics to inspire our people. And it's inspiration that we need to begin to crack the poverty we've got. Because this is one of the poorest places uh, in, the, in the United Kingdom. In fact, when you take the Olympic boroughs, it's the area, highest area of non-employment anywhere in Europe. A place the size of Birmingham with large numbers of people who aren't working. We'd need 20,000 people extra into work just to get up to the London average. So for us... It's really important that we see people developing and getting job opportunities. Now, we believe in the concept, something we call resilience. It's about building personal capacity. It's about aspiration, empowerment, grit, the ability to deal with things that come because we have developed a dependency culture, which means that many of our people, not only, well, they don't know how to get to work, we're on fourth generation of people in families who haven't worked. And we believe we've got to do something about that. So uh, we've got a, a workplace brokerage that, that gets 5,000 people into work, of whom half have not been in work for, for more than a year. Uh, and what we do there is, it's interesting in London, it's not that there aren't jobs in London, it's that we face international competition. Uh, and what we find is that when an East Ender comes into our brokerage, if we send our CVs out, 2% of them get job offers. But if we work with an employer to understand what the employer wants, then 50% of them get jobs. And if we embed somebody in an employer, so we really understand what they want, 80% of them get jobs. So we believe we know how to get people into low-skilled jobs, start-up jobs, but what do you do then? You cannot then just say, some people, that may be what they're capable of and that may be where they are, and we believe you should respect that and work should pay something back. That's why we're saying we'll give social housing to people who are working because we think we should give something back. But what's really important then is to upskill them. And skills for us are one of the big areas that we have significant problems in in this country. I actually don't think we understand skills. I think we treat people who go and try and upskill with a degree of contempt. I'll ask you a question. Why do 40% of the young people who do hairdressing in our local college have never end up working in hairdressing. They're just stuck on a course. Kids that maybe aren't so good academically, and we don't then say we should be looking to make sure they get something back from that. It'd be all right when they started the course if we said, you're not going to get a job, you're just here for fun, but we don't do that. And I think one of the things we believe is that we have to start with the employers, and that is why this 
This event is so important to us, and that's why I wanted to come here today to welcome you. The idea that we would seek to skill people up, working with employers, making those jobs relevant, making those skills relevant, that is something we think we're not very good at, we need to get better at, and this is the sort of event that we think can help us do that. It's an important event. Uh, welcome to Newham. Uh, I hope you've all paid your fee. We expect, everybody has to pay £50 to come to Newham. It's such a great place to come, so we're looking for a fee from you, if you wouldn't mind. Otherwise, I hope you have a really good time. I want to thank you for coming here, and I want to say that the message we send from here is so important because it says to young people, we, we really are going to try to make sure the skills you get are relevant and that that can lead then to the sort of life that many of our young people would aspire to. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Ethelie. Thank you. Well, thank you very much again to the Mayor of Newham, Sir Robin Wells. We're now going to have another short presentation, and I'm pleased to say that Martin Donnelly is our next speaker, who joined the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills as Permanent Secretary in 2010. Martin has extensive economic and international experience and has worked in many key government departments. The Department for Business, Innovation and Skills, or BIS, as you may have heard it referred to, have been a key sponsor and supporter throughout the last few years as we build up towards this World Skills event and also during the event as well. And to introduce the Secretary of State formally, please give a very warm welcome to Martin Donnelly. Good morning to you, Martin. Thank welcome you very to you. much, Nadine. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to all of you representing, I know, 58 countries, and I believe we have 15 ministers also present, marking just how important uh, we are here today at World Skills Forum. I am the senior civil servant in the Department of Business, Innovation, and Skills. We cover business and enterprise, trade, investment, consumer affairs, innovation, science, research, further and higher education, and of course, skills. The current priority for this government and this country is to stimulate renewed economic growth. And our department is at the heart of that, working for our ministers. We support business and fair and free markets. We stimulate innovation in science and research, and we promote skills. I want to cover these briefly in turn. We look at the health of our business sector. We deal with issues like regulation. Do we have too much of it? Is it of the wrong sort? How do we help businesses develop export markets in today's global economy? Are we doing enough to help young people in particular develop a spirit of enterprise, help existing businesses to grow, to export, and new businesses to establish? And we know that for businesses to succeed in competitive markets depends on their ability to develop new products, to innovate, to work flexibly, find new ways of doing things. Just this week, our department announced a £50 million global research and technology hub connecting UK research and business to commercialise the Nobel Prize winning super strong material graphene. This will bring researchers and businesses together and is the latest example of British science being used to help British business create new jobs. We also work with our universities sector, old and new, to ensure that companies come out of universities and flourish in the marketplace. In recent years, we've had 40 university spin-offs floated on the stock exchange with a value of nearly £2 billion. 25 university spin-off companies have been acquired by other businesses worth now more than £3 billion. But most importantly, as we all know here today, business and innovation cannot thrive without the right skills. The sort of skills that the people around us here in Excel are showing over the next few days. This department is responsible for ensuring that everyone in England, aged 19 and over, can get the education and training they deserve in a university, a college, or in a company that offers apprenticeships. And we see apprenticeships as the gold standard for workplace training. Many of the competing Team UK 
our apprentices building successful and rewarding careers in their chosen areas, they're also building the British economy and this country's future prosperity. One example from Rolls-Royce, who announced in March a new state-of-the-art apprentice training facility in Derby, doubling their apprentice capacity in key engineering skills. We also, as you will know, in Britain, have a proud history of combining innovation with craftsmanship. We produced the world's first steam engine, the first metal ship, the first jet engine, the first electronic computer, and more recently, the first bagless vacuum cleaner. Of course, the achievements of the past have to be the foundation for future success. We know the market for skills is becoming increasingly international, and Britain has a huge amount to offer in that market. And that's why I want to end by stressing the importance that World Skills 2011 gives us a chance to learn from each other. There are many different languages, different cultures represented here. Our economic conditions and circumstances differ, but we all know and are committed to the value of skills, and we all admire and support the young people here today who are showing us the best of those skills. And now I'm delighted to introduce our Secretary of State, the political head of the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills, the Right Honourable Dr. Vincent Cable. Thank you. Well, good morning and uh, a warm welcome from me on behalf of the government to World Skills, which is a you know, really remarkable, actually inspirational event. I'm delighted to be here. And I'm particularly delighted uh, for it to be in London, I mean, not simply because we're the host, but because of the messages which it sends to my own country. Um, through their talent and endeavor, we've got roughly a thousand competitors here, 50 countries, uh, setting an example and sending a very powerful message that skills are a source of pride and self-worth, uh, as well as a basis for their own career success and financial security. Now, we in the UK are, like many of the other countries represented here, are trying to recover from a very deep uh, economic crisis and recession. Uh, we're also in London uh, trying to address the social problems that contributed to the riots that we had here in the summer. Uh, and skills offer a solution to both challenges. Uh, they're essential to economic growth, as my permanent secretary has just uh, set out, but they're just as necessary for social inclusion. Now, uh, the government I represent, the coalition government, has been in power now for just over a year, and I want to highlight some of the ways in which we're trying to shape the skills agenda. But let me start with this point. My, my point of departure is that, of course, we have very high hopes for the British team in this event. Uh, I'm sure and I hope they have a very large haul of medals. But the, the brutal truth is that this competition won't provide a very accurate representation of the skills base in the country. Of course, the reality is that compared with a lot of countries, uh, we have a large number of people with low qualifications. Uh, although we do indeed perform pretty well at the graduate level, uh, including science, technology, engineering, and maths. But we are 19th out of 34 in the OECD in terms of skills above GCSE level. And in the table of European Union countries, ranked in order of hours of training per individual trainees, one of the basic metrics, we're actually bottom. And I think it's best to be honest with ourselves from the outset about these failings, um, because that then provides a benchmark of how we should improve uh, in, if we're going to overcome the productivity gap between the UK and other leading industrial countries. Because at the moment, we don't have a fully internationally competitive skills base and that, in turn, defines our ambition, which is to be amongst the world's leaders within the next decade. And the government's actions and policies have to be understood against that objective. 
And the task we face concretely uh, is to produce hundreds of thousands of more young people whose skills merit comparison with those of the UK team at the skills uh, at, the, at the competition here. <coughs> now, the most visible and tangible policy we're implementing is to increase dramatically the number of apprenticeships. We're creating the biggest apprenticeship program the UK has seen in modern times. And this reflects the preferences, which are becoming very clear, of young people who wish to do this, uh, and also of employers. And I think Sir Robin Wales' comments in his introduction about the need for employer demand is absolutely critical. Uh, as uh, the Permanent Secretary said a few moments ago, uh, apprenticeships are not the only mechanism, but they are the most universally recognized method of gold standard training. And it's no accident that two-thirds of the UK's team is made up of former apprentices. And we know several very specific things about apprenticeships. First of all, that apprentices help their employers to boost productivity. There is clear evidence to that effect. Uh, secondly, uh, that uh, employers very quickly recoup their investment, uh, typically within three years. Uh, and that every pound of public investment in apprenticeships generates, we estimate, something of the order of £40 for the wider economy. So that's why we made a specific decision a year ago when we were faced with very tough decisions on public spending priorities to support and deliver at least 250,000 more apprenticeships than were planned over the next uh, four-year period. So that's a minimum of 250,000 more in England alone. Uh, and the emphasis is on advanced apprenticeships in sectors of the economy where we have the potential to gain a competitive advantage. I mean, what essentially we're doing is uh, trying to revive a technician class within our own workforce in order to increase our capability in engineering and manufacturing in particular. And we're targeting support at small and medium-sized enterprises who employ, as it happens, proportionately larger numbers of apprentices compared with large employers, but often find it difficult to set up and finance apprenticeship schemes and often fear that their trainees are poached. Now, the early signs of this initiative are very positive. Indeed, I came into the hall this morning, met a couple of college principals who told me that their uh, apprenticeship demand is soaring, you know, within the last, literally within the last few months. And provisional data showing that we exceeded our target for 2010-11 of more than 200,000 apprenticeship starts for 19-year-olds and over. But absolute numbers are only one measure of course, quality is important as well as quantity. And in tandem with extra investment, we're making a real effort across the skills sector to reduce the bureaucracy that FE colleges in particular and other training providers have had to contend with for far too long. Uh, we believe that colleges need the freedom to serve the best interests of their students and employers. We're therefore abolishing uh, centrally imposed targets on colleges, we're streamlining contract and funding processes, we're simplifying quality assurance and assessment of provision, and altogether it represents a different kind of relationship between government and trainers. It's left heavy-handed, more trusting, uh, enabling colleges and other training providers to respond swiftly to demands from industry. Uh, and on this front, the government has created a fund to encourage businesses to come together to identify and invest the skills that they need. And this is the Growth and Innovation Fund, uh, worth up to 50 million annually. And it's there to provide concentrated seed funding for employer-led projects that attract further co-financing from business. And I can confirm today uh, that projects are now in place for a range of sectors following the first round of applications to this fund. And in this first wave, we'll be injecting over £10 million alongside a comparable investment from employers. In fact, just give a few examples. Uh, Renewable UK, which is the sector trade association, is leading a pro project to establish a trading network in renewable energy 
and it brings together employers, colleges, universities, and others. And after a two-year period of pump priming, this network will be self-financing from 2013. Amongst the other successful uh, bids have been an academy for healthcare, uh, another for creative industries, for science-based industries, and, for example, a project uh, developing training within the manufacturing supply chain of the nuclear power industry. Now, I hope this project and others will spur more sectors to come up with creative ideas when we invite a second round of applications later this year. But I don't want to give the impression uh, that we've adopted a strictly utilitarian approach to skills and learning. Uh, before I became a, a government minister, I was quite closely involved in supporting the adult community college in my own parliamentary constituency, which does absolutely wonderful work with, with adults in performing arts. I have the model of my own mother who left school at 15 to work in a factory and then discovered the arts through um, adult, adult education and was lifted up and inspired by it. And there are many people who have experiences of that kind and who have learned to appreciate that learning in all its forms is good for our well-being. But what I've seen of world skills so far only confirms what I've seen up and down the country. I spend a lot of time trying to get out on regional visits, looking at colleges, universities and companies, and within recent weeks, uh, been to see the engineering apprentices at Rolls-Royce in Derby, opened a new academy, um, then met uh, veterinary science students at Solihull College, going through to degree level uh, training, and indeed people doing dance and photography at uh, my local college in, in the borough of Richmond. Uh, the process of learning new skills produces not just qualifications, but it produces confidence, optimism, a sense of purpose amongst young and old alike. And it was important, I think, for those reasons uh, that we in the coalition government took the decision last year to safeguard the adult learning budget in the lifetime of this parliament. And we're currently reviewing how best to apportion this money, uh, working with the likes of the Open University, the BBC and the British Library, on providing more resources for adults online. And then as additional measure for developing inclusion, uh, we've recently created a new ladder to apprenticeships to widen access for young people who require extra support before they embark on apprenticeship training. It's workplace-based and it gives people aged 16 to 24 without the necessary qualifications or experience on their CVs an opportunity to convince prospective employers of their aptitude and employability. And the access to apprenticeship scheme will help up to 10,000 people this academic year with similar numbers in future years. Now, these are young people who may hopefully be inspired by skills competitions like this one. Indeed, the greatest legacy that we want to see from World Skills is a UK-wide increase in esteem and participation in vocational skills. I think we've for far too long had this idea of some kind of caste system that people do academic work and it's up here and vocational training is down there. We must get rid of that and we must establish real esteem uh, and pride associated with vocational training, apprenticeships in particular. So this is only the beginning. We're working with the private sector on various employer-led schemes, the establishment of new professional standards, occupational licensing, and the introduction of voluntary training levies. Uh, professional occupation standards don't just provide quality assurance to the customer and signal the prestige of certain careers within the labor market. They also support more effective and less intrusive regulation in many sectors, but also ensure that the workforce is up to scratch. And training levies, like those already in operation in construction, uh, boost the skills base, including smaller businesses which are exempt for reasons of scale, but who are nonetheless entitled to funding to improve the capability of their staff.
Now, these are the schemes which the Growth and Innovation Fund is there for, to help them get off the ground. And in the first round of bids, uh, there are a couple of very good examples of levy schemes, uh, one in the energy sector, uh, and there are a couple of occupational licensing schemes, one in hospitality, the other in employment services. Now, elsewhere, we're determined to improve progression routes from apprenticeships to higher-level qualifications, such as university degrees, uh, we've proposed loans to help adults afford advanced level further education. And just as with our reforms to the university system, we're trying to put purchasing power directly in the hands of students. Now, as I've said, we want all employers in their respective sectors to take greater ownership of the task of raising skills to achieve sustainable growth. And I'm discussing with the UK Commission for Employment and Skills what would happen if government really got out of the way and leaving them, the employers, the trade unions and the education sector to drive the vocational skills agenda. Now in all of this we're applying a couple of fundamental principles and it's with those that I will conclude. The first is that the vocational route to individual success and fulfillment is just as legitimate as the academic. Snobbery isn't just tiresome, it is completely self-defeating. And the second is that we want UK prosperity to be built on high quality products and services made and delivered by an able and motivated workforce. Investment in skills therefore represents an investment in the UK in the long term and from the bottom up. So thank you for listening. I'm afraid I now have to leave very quickly to embark on the tour of the exhibition. Uh, but I just uh, hope very much that you'll enjoy the rest of the competition and thank you again for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you very much to the Right Honourable Dr Vince Cable and as he mentioned he's off to the exhibition now to see the competition firsthand. I hope you enjoy the day and obviously we'll be picking up on some of those themes later up as well but particularly what was very uh, prevalent, that two-tier system, how can we raise those standards really of vocational education and training so as the same respect that we give to academia, to academics and universities and to get employers to take great ownership over skills as well I thought was a, a very good point as well and particularly sob snobbery is not just tiresome it is self-defeating when it comes to vocational education training and apprenticeship so thank you very much to Dr Vince Cable. We're now going to look at the skills debate from the union perspective and you heard Vince talk about obviously the unions having that role to play as well so what a role exactly does the Trade Union Congress or TUC have in harnessing the talents and the skills of the workforce and what contribution can it make to help make the UK thrive and prosper. Well France O'Grady became the Deputy General Secretary in 2003 and in fact was the first woman to actually take up that role and in her role Frances is responsible for a wide range of key areas including learning and skills. Frances is also a member of the Apprenticeship Ambassadors Network and the Skills Funding Agency and here to talk about helping ordinary people really achieve truly extraordinary things, please give a very warm welcome to Francis O'Grady. Good morning to you, Francis. Thank you. Thanks. thanks very much. And thanks very much for the opportunity to contribute a view on behalf of working people in the TUC. Uh, I believe that skills are absolutely central to our future, not just to the urgent task of restoring growth, but to the wider challenge of rebuilding a stronger, fairer economy. But with the risk of a global recession ever closer, let's be frank, this is a mighty challenge. With bills rising and real wages falling, many ordinary families are just a paycheck away from disaster. And with two and a half million people unemployed and five people chasing every published job vacancy, the promise that retraining will lead to a brighter future, frankly, can ring pretty hollow. And perhaps most worrying of all, one million young people in Britain today have no job, no apprenticeship or no place at a university. What a criminal waste of young talent and what a heavy social price the rest of us may end up paying. 
In the trade union movement, we've always argued that improving the supply of skills is only half of the answer. If we really want to get Britain working again, then we need to boost business demand for skills. And to do that, we're going to have to get the banks getting credit flowing to businesses. Half, after all, we still own half of them. We're going to need businesses, more businesses, to up their investment and modernise. And from BAE to Bombardia, we need government to start backing productive businesses and jobs with an intelligent, greener industrial strategy for growth. And part of that strategy must include government supporting workers who want to learn by holding to account the one third of employers in the UK who still fail to invest in their own staff skills. Now, decent employers represented in this hall can't afford to carry those freeloader firms and workers can't afford the vulnerability that the failure to invest in their skills brings. But I want to focus on people because too often, I think, in this debate, we talk about uh, human resources when instead we should be talking about human beings. In the trade union movement, we're helping to improve the skills of ordinary men and women, boosting self-esteem, shifting horizons, transforming lives. We believe it's important to raise the skills of all workers, not just the chosen few, so that we harness the talents of everyone in society. And by taking learning to working people, we are helping to make the UK more productive, more competitive, and more flexible to meet the demands of an increasingly volatile global economy. And my key message today is this. If you want to transform skills, then engage the people who are the real wealth creators. Listen to their hopes and fears. Listen to their ideas. Listen to their aspirations. Sometimes we don't say it enough, but you can't do learning to people, only with them. Real change can only be achieved with workers by providing learning how, when, and where it suits them as well as the firm they work for. And that's where we in the trade union movement come in. As a trusted representative at work, we form a crucial link between the interests of workers, people who sometimes are even reluctant to talk about their skills needs, and the interests of business. Our 28,000 union learning representatives identify workers' needs, talk to them about their ambitions, work out what the boss needs, and then match them with practical training opportunities, often on site in one of our hundreds of workplace learning centres. Now, I'm proud of our record in engaging some of the hardest to reach groups of workers, part-time workers, uh, the night shift, older workers and young workers just starting out, the men and women who quietly struggle every day with literacy and numeracy needs. And I'm proud of the work that we do in opening those opportunities, not just to workers, but very often to their families and to local communities too. And we don't just encourage people to participate, we encourage them to progress. People like the firefighter down in Brighton, who left school with virtually no qualifications, always reluctant to go into the classroom. His union encouraged him to sign up for courses it was running in the workplace. As a result, he got the learning bug and now he's completed a PhD. Or people like the cleaner at Central Lancashire University who used to work emptying the bins in the law department there after her union encouraged her to take those first difficult steps back into learning, she never looked back. Today, six years later, she's working as a part-time lecturer in the very same law department. Or people like Mandy, another cleaner, this time with the transport company up on Merseyside. Thanks to a very good partnership with her employer, Mandy's union enrolled her onto IT literacy and numeracy courses 
She went on to get new qualifications in business administration and landed herself a new job in the same company. And now through her union, she's inspiring more of her workmates to take up learning opportunities. Just three stories out of nearly a quarter of a million real human stories of how union learn is driving a lifelong learning revolution in workplaces, large and small, uh, manufacturing and services, public and private. We're boosting skills at every level, from skills for life to apprenticeships, from professional development to higher degrees. 21st century trade unionism can't just be about helping people to get equal. It's got to be about helping them to get on at work and in life. And it's a model that we're working with sister unions around the world. So what does business and government gain from involving trade unions in skills? Well, you get a real insight into what workers really want. You get a new partnership for workplace learning. And as the evidence consistently shows, you get real workplace performance gains. Don't just take my word for it. Read the testimonies of executives at companies like Rolls-Royce or Boots. Listen to the praise from council leaders or health service leaders. Talk to the politicians of every major political party who are committed to union-based learning here in Britain. And as you're wandering around the competition, watching the bricklayers or the car mechanics at work, ask yourself how many of these workers will have been assisted by their own trade union. It may be more than you think. So in this changing world, the trade union movement is changing too, showing how ordinary working people and business too, that skills is the best insurance policy in this age of globalization. As I said at the beginning, our focus will always quite properly be on the interests and needs of real people in real workplaces. And as the voice of ordinary workers, trade unions have a unique and powerful contribution to bring to the skills debate. The trade union movement wants to be partners in building stronger, fairer, and more sustainable businesses. So use us, involve us, and challenge us, and together, we can raise skills and ambitions and hopes for working people and businesses in Britain today. Thank you. Thank you very much there to uh, Francis O'Grady as well, and great to hear some real human stories as well and hearing about that engagement. Just interested to know, though, obviously with the changes in the workplace that we've seen over the last few years, the amount of young people, NEET, not in education, employment, training, is substantially high. Other countries around face a similar problem. What are the trade unions doing in particular to engage young people? So you become that representative for young people in training and apprenticeships. Is that a space that I'd imagine is quite difficult to fill at the moment? It's a, it's a space we are filling. I mean, frankly, I think many of our young people, 99.9% um, .9 of them, who are, really want to get a job, really want to get on at work, uh, want to get good training opportunities or a good education. They're facing a really rough time at the moment, mm. is the truth. Yeah. And the trade union movement has been championing the interests of young workers, apprentices, but also, I have to say, unpaid interns too. A lot of young people also at risk of exploitation. So we are standing up for them, we are organising them. But I think our union learning reps have a really crucial role to play. In many workplaces, we are the mentor mm. for the young apprentice, and we've proved that by playing that role, they're much more likely to complete their apprenticeship, they're much more likely to do well. It's like having a best friend at work, and that's often what young people need. Well, Francis O'Grady, you'll be part of the panel discussion. Thank you very much for your presentation this morning. Looking forward to seeing you back later on. Francis O'Grady, everybody. Thank you very much, Francis. And we're going to carry on that theme about real workers' engagement now. Christine Hodgson has been with Cap Gemini for 13 years and is currently their executive chairman. She also chairs the 
their UK Sustainability Board, as well as leading their Women's Business Network. And today we're going to find out how Capgemini is raising the aspirations of young people and increasing the amount of apprenticeships they have to offer, which I hope is going to give real insight and advice to everybody in the room, maybe from the same sector or other sectors, on why we need young talent and how we can all secure, develop and retain this talent going forward. So from Austria to Australia, with 25,000 reasons to support global skills, please give a very warm welcome to Christine Hodgson. Good morning to you, nice to see you. I'm not too sure about uh, Austria to Australia, but... Uh, so here's a, a little bit about um, Capgemini's views around the whole uh, youth agenda. If I just tell you a little word for those of you that are not familiar with Capgemini, I think there should be a slide coming up. It is coming up. Okay, let me do it without slides. We are an, a global organization. We are um, involved in the IT services industry. We advise consulting, technology, and outsourcing. We employ about 110,000 people worldwide. A very significant portion uh, of those people are based out of India, which won't come as a surprise to you. In the UK, we employ about 8,000 people. And we're working with organizations both in the private sector and in the public sector. Our philosophy, people matter, results count. We only have one asset, it's our people. So we're very interested in the youth agenda our commitment on, on the youth talent to align the education and career development opportunities for young people with the IT roles of the future. And that's particularly relevant as you see so many roles now being done in low-cost centers offshore. A couple of years ago, when uh, Business in the Community launched Work Inspiration, Capgemini felt um, very compelled to champion this. For those of you that are not aware what, work what the Work Inspiration Programme is all about, it's all about giving relevant, meaningful, inspiring work experience to young people. I don't know about all of you in the room, but if I look back to my own work experience, it was quite pitiful. I, I was stuck in the corner of a, a, of a very small accountancy firm with a, a, an A3 piece of paper, a pencil and a rubber, and I spent a week there. Um, I think on the Friday I was rewarded by cleaning the boss's cupboard. Um, and probably the, the saddest indictment about me is I still became an accountant at the end of it. But I think that all of us have, um, all employers, whatever size, have a duty to offer work experience that really opens the eyes of young people to what the corporate world, in my case, is all about. I think we have a role that very much is around demystifying it. If we look at how, I, I don't think it's, um, it, it, it's credible to think that schools and careers advisors can really help young people uh, navigate their way through the, through the whole labyrinth of the corporate world that's out there. So what we've tried to do, um, the bit C, the business in the community aspiration is to, do, to hit a target of 200,000 of these work inspirations. Now, in our small way at Capgemini, we committed to do 500. And what we tried to do was say, we're not just going to bring young people in and, and ask them to, to follow us around for a week. We'll try and come up with something that is really innovative. And it wasn't about trying to, to recruit them to us. It really was just trying to say, work is, is OK. Because some of the young people have come from families where there are generations that have never worked. And so, trying to demystify it, what we did, we said, let's do something a bit creative. I'll give you an example of one of the things we did. So we are basically a services business. We have a lot of consultants. So we said, well, let's bring young people in and try and solve a real business issue. So bring together our client, their issue, young people, our professionals, and let's solve a real problem. We brought in, for example, um, people from the Metropolitan Police, which is one of our clients. We brought in some young people and we said, let's work the issue. How do you encourage volunteers and young people to be more attracted to youth organizations in inner London? So these young people, they troop into this big corporate office. They're slightly startled, quite terrified. 
And by the time they leave, having had their, 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 their voice listened to, their ideas worked through, they leave at the end of the day standing a foot taller and thinking, you know what, this is, this is okay, this, this is actually quite enjoyable. And what we've encouraged then is our clients, so the Met Police, to go off and do the same in their own supply chain and create a whirlpool effect, a ripple effect, try and get as many organizations as possible to link into the Work Inspiration campaign. And the lesson that we've learned from trying to do 500 is that the way to do it is do it in as structured way as possible. So some of the other organizations that have been engaged in the program have operated summer camps, and that's what Capgemini will be doing in 2012. It will be week-long programs where we start at things that are very basic, readiness for work. It's amazing how a lot of these young people have no clue how to, how to dress, how just to shake hands, how to, en how to engage. There are simple things that we can help with. And so the program will start with a few basics, but it will also be project-driven. These young people love leaving at the end of the week having done something, having built something, having some pride. And so that's what we're trying to do, and we're trying to spread the word. Going beyond uh, work inspiration, the thing that uh, is very much center of our agenda, and which is obviously uh, interesting listening to Vince Cable this morning, is around apprenticeships. Traditionally, IT services firms, indeed the whole professional services sector, have never looked beyond graduates. So we've always considered that the lowest intake we would take would be a graduate probably with a first or a, or, or a 2-1 degree. And that is now fundamentally shifted. Our thinking now is that we, are, we will take many more apprentices than we will take graduates. Of course, of course there will be both. But this year, um, we took 120 apprentices, both advanced apprentices and higher apprentices. And next year, we'll take 50% more. And for us, the, the really exciting area is the higher apprentices. And what that means is we offer A-level students who don't want to go to university, we offer them a real alternative. We say, come to us. Here's a five-year commitment. At the end of it, you will get a degree, a Bachelor of Science, because we'll be working closely with educational establishments to get you a very structured training program. And over that five-year period, you will work with us, and we will train you in the hot skills in our market. So at the end of five years, you'll be debt-free. You will have um, fantastic experience, very relevant for the roles that the market wants to buy at the moment. And you, you will have a professional qualification. And we're seeing a huge appetite of young people to take up those apprentices. There is, though, something around um, and touching on something that, that Vince Cable was saying. We do have, in our sector, some education to do around this, whether it's educating the young people or parents or, or schools. Because when you say the word apprentice, there is still um, a perception that it's around uh, hairdressers, plumbers, it's, it's not something that's around uh, software developers or, 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 or lawyers or, 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 or accountants. And so there is an education that we, need, that we need to work on to change the perception. Even talking to some of my friends whose, whose children now are doing A-levels and they say, oh, I don't know whether, don't know whether Joe wants to go to university. I said, well, why, why, don't they, why don't they do a scheme uh, like, like we offer? I said, well, apprentice, well, is, that, is that okay? So we've got a huge, a huge education to do, um, but I think we can do it. And what we're trying to do is encourage the rest of the sector to do the same. And actually, we're, we're pushing on an open door. So last month, we hosted um, a, a, an IT sector apprenticeship, apprenticeship day where we all got together and talked about what we need to do as a sector to create more IT apprenticeships. So this was competitors sitting in a room, there were other, there were, there were, there were, client, there were clients of all of ours in, in the room, and there were also the, the likes of City and Gills, eSkills, um, uh, and, and other organizations there to help us and to help us frame this. And at the end of that day, we made a commitment that we would create, um, create a charter. And number one, it would be around actually committing to taking more apprentices. And secondly, it was around creating 
uh, 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 developing a nationally recognized IT career path so for the entry for apprenticeships so that we can market it to schools, to careers, advise, careers advisors, and, and so it makes it far easier for young people to see the opportunities uh, and to engage with industry. Of course, I've put it in the context of, of the technology sector. It's just as relevant for every sector. And yes, we are a very big company, but for me, it's just as relevant for small and medium enterprises. So I would say my advice is that for anyone, any organization, whatever the sector, if you're not already involved, either in work inspiration or involved in apprenticeships, then take the first steps because yes, you'll find some bureaucracy that needs to be overcome. And in fact, we were, we were counseling Vince Cable this morning to try and get rid of some of that. But take the first steps because the impact is very significant. There are real business benefits for doing it and there's huge benefits for young people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, um, Christine. Just very interesting what you talked about professional services have never looked beyond graduates traditionally. That's right. That's and um, right. it's very encouraging for you to hear, see that. What happened? What was that sea change that made you think, actually, we need to broaden our horizons. We need to look beyond our traditional models because professional services could have got away with this for so much longer. And I'm just wondering whether yep. others within that, that big four have followed your lead as well. I, I think the, the papers now are full of organizations like ours and like the, um, you know, the PwCs, the Deloitte's, the KPMG's who are all addressing this. I think it's driven by a number of things all coming together at the same time. Um, so that there are real business drivers. We need, we need more young talent, so we need a greater pool. Uh, that there are cost issues, so it, it, you know, I'm, I make no apology that apprentices are, are, uh, are more cost effective than, than graduates. And of course then you've got this whole backdrop of the tuition fees question. And so you can see that actually if we, if we didn't open our, our mind to apprenticeships, we, we would be, have a different issue, which is how we're going to help the graduates cope with the tuition fees. So actually I, I think it was a coming together of a number of things. And it's like a light bulb moment, mm. sort of, why haven't we done this for years? And very timely with tuition fees. And very, very timely. And, and of course, then with the government announcing uh, the support on apprenticeships, mm. apprenticeships as well, uh, it's, it's, it, there is absolutely no reason to, to, to not to do it. Well, fantastic to hear that. I'm sure we've only heard the tip of the iceberg. You'll be joining us back on the Thanks. panel discussion. Thanks. Christine Hodgson, everybody. Thank you, Christine. Well, our next speaker is Steve Holliday. He joined National Grid in 2001 with responsibility for the group's electricity and gas transmission business. In 2006, Steve became their chief executive. Now, prior to joining National Grid, Steve was on the board of British Borneo Oil and Gas and was responsible for the successful development of international businesses in Brazil, Australia and West Africa. Steve has a huge amount of international experience and during his time at Exxon, which is going back a few more years, also worked in Asia and the Far East, including China. Now, National Grid is right at the heart of one of the greatest challenges in society today, the creation of a new sustainable energy solution for the future. And here to talk about those challenges and what skills are needed to engineer our future, please welcome Steve Holliday. Hi, Steve. Welcome to you. Thank you very much. Good morning. As you just heard, this is an extremely important time for the energy industry. Industry, as you've heard, I've been in for rather a long time these days as well. How we shape our energy future is one of the most significant issues of this age, not just in the UK, for the world at large. And it affects everybody. It doesn't just affect people who work in industry, it affects every member of society. In the UK, the commitment that we have to reducing our carbon emissions is enshrined in a unique piece of legislation. And we're making progress towards a target of cutting our greenhouse gases by 34% by 2020. And recently, the fourth carbon budget was published by a committee of the government here and accepted by the government in May, actually recommends a reduction now of 60% by 2030. An extraordinary change from the past. But all of that needs to be seen in, in the context of infrastructure. Pipes, wires, power stations that are very old in an economy in a country, of course, that's been industrialized for 70 years. 
a quarter of the power plants in the UK will be shut by the early 2020s. And while all that change is going on, the population is expected to grow considerably. By 2050, the number of households in the UK will have risen to 35 million. That's a 40% increase on where we are today. And of course, what goes with that is a huge increase in the demand for energy. But it's also a fantastic opportunity because these things are old and need replacing. So we have an opportunity to replace these assets with a different system, a modern system for the future, an efficient system, a smart system that changes the way that we as consumers all use our energy. The company I represent, National Grid, is a very privileged position in this industry, sitting at the, at the heart of it. Our job is very simply to describe as the connectors. We connect everything up. So during this period of enormous change, we've got a very vital role to play to help design and build smart networks that will be fit for the 21st century. A modern energy system that delivers clean, secure, and increasingly importantly, affordable energy. And it's crucial, therefore, that we have the talent coming in, the quality and quantity of people that we need for the future. Over the next nine years, we're looking to recruit in the UK alone 2,500 highly skilled engineers and scientists. And that is going to be a mixture, a theme you've heard this morning already from two or three people. It is going to be graduates, absolutely, but it's going to be a mixture of development, trainees, experienced people, and right back to 17, 18 year old coming in as apprentices. Every one of those is vital to our business. But one thing that's consistent across all of those is we need STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We need a passion for those subjects, a base level of understanding, and we need people who are creative as well. Here in the UK, there are some frightening, absolutely frightening statistics in terms of the demand and the supply of people who have studied these subjects. The CBI did a piece of work that said that three out of four, three out of four businesses in the UK rely on people with STEM qualifications. The UK CES study showed that between the late uh, years in the last decade, 2009 through to about 2018, 29% of all jobs in the UK require a STEM education to at least the GCSE standard. And of all the new jobs that government talk about so fervently and so enthusiastically and rightly, 58% of all those jobs require STEM education. Of course, there's a but. And the but is, a study that my own company carried out in 2009 found incredibly negative attitudes towards engineering in particular. Six out of ten young people can't describe what an engineer does, can't name an engineering achievement. Parents, young people, teachers even, have an image around engineering that is very old-fashioned, very dirty, very low-paid. In fact, incredible anecdotes from the UK. People who live in the city of London talk about engineering as isn't that something they do in the north of the country? Isn't that what we used to do a hundred years ago? And of course, not surprisingly, I think, but frighteningly, girls are ten times less likely to pursue a career in engineering. Young people just can't visualise this. I'm talking in the UK, so all my remarks are focused here on the UK. We've carried out this piece of work in the United States as well. And guess what? The data is almost identical. It's quite incredible. So much of this imagery around science, technology, engineering is identical in the USA as well. So we have a real job of work to do here to get the better understanding. If we're to meet the level of recruitment that we need, we've got to recognize we've got to draw people from a wide pool. We've got to be able to mobilize, as Christine was talking about, this indigenous young population into work. 
And I'm not someone who stands in front of you and talks about what other people need to do. It starts with business, it starts with ourselves. We have to be able to articulate though, to educators and policy makers what we need as employers. Be very, very clear about what we need, what the entry qualifications from an academic point of view are, and of course what the mix of skills and personal attributes are. And as you've been hearing, we've got to inspire people. That's such a critical word. Not give them an experience, give them a real inspiration about the jobs in my industry, how exciting they are, and therefore the value of their education. And critically highlight that going to university and getting a degree is not the only route. There are different pathways into work, all equally valuable, and ultimately potentially all leading to the same place, whether they're training apprentices or graduates. We're focused on a lot of these areas. Vince Cable mentioned very briefly technicians. At the Technician Council in the UK, we're trying to enhance the status, being very, very clear about the pride that people should have in being a technician across science, engineering, and indeed the IT sector. Making sure that people get the respect for being a professional technician through business in the community, all that work that you've been hearing about and getting behind youth un unemployment. My own company, getting people into schools. We engaged with 3,000 school children last year through open days, clubs, and work experience. And there's a great deal of, of, of passion around ensuring that we get education policy right. And there is, unfortunately, a focus of policymakers that can often be interpreted as fragmented, even exclusive, with attention from some of the ministers on traditional education routes, while an, another minister with a clear responsibility is very focused on apprenticeships. We need to get these joined up. If we're to have the skilled people that my business and the energy industry needs, we've got to join these things up. The answer has to be we need the whole spectrum. We've got to get from graduates through to engineers. We have to make sure that the government understand that. But more generally as an employer, there's a lot we agree with that's going on. The focus and rigor on standards in the basic academic subjects, especially in these science areas up to the age of 16, is there today and it's vitally important. The wider choice of schools, the wider choice of how children get educated, free schools, academies, the university technical colleges, focusing on vocational skills earlier in the life, and realignment of some of those qualifications. But there's a huge explosion and a reinvention of this word vocation again, which does worry me. Just as Christine was articulating some of the connotations around that well-used word of apprenticeships, there's similar connotations around vocation. Ah. My child's going to go to a vocational school. That means two things. One, they're clearly not very clever. And two, they're obviously going to be less successful in their life. We have to crack some of the language around here and explain the confusion, the misunderstanding, that that is not the case. It's a different way of learning. But we can't use sight of the fact we need to motivate these young people. We've got to show them the exciting jobs that are around there. And I know, in my business, how important it is to measure things, to hold people to account. And it's right that we have measurements around our education system, and schools and teachers do need to be held to account for the progress of, of their children. But what's happened in this country is we created the league tables. And it's led to an inevitability of everything is focused on the league table. And that leads, sadly, to examples of very narrow, uninspiring teaching to test to make sure we get the statistics and get the league table right. And just the same in business, one metric doesn't cut it. We've got to make sure our education system isn't driven solely by examination results. We've got to recognize teachers who inspire children, who infuse their students to want to find out far more and that was just in the curriculum. And whilst there are things that the policymakers can and should do, 
there's plenty that schools can do. They've got to seek opportunities to engage with employers. My own business tries very hard to get into schools, sometimes hugely successfully, on other occasions rejected. We don't have the time to engage with employers. And yet employers have a rich opportunity to help with the curriculum and to show students in particular how the things that they are studying, how they're applied in the real world. And getting, as you heard, to demystify business. There's a wonderful quote from some, from some, from some kids who've been on work inspiration with us. Unfortunately, it's not one quote. It's been said by many children. Do you know, the people I've met during the course of this week are quite nice. The assumption clearly that everyone who worked in business had three heads and was horrible was extraordinary. Where has that come from? So we've got to get business to work closer with schools. And we need schools to think outside their curricula, to join up maths and science in the real world. And the subjects don't sit in isolation. How to get projects that cross those, those sciences and also be very clear about where the bar is set. Level three in the UK attainment is essential. If things aren't in the syllabus, then get businesses to come in and explain how we use scientists and engineers. It's not either or, the fact that we require both. And what you end up doing with your life is very different from what you've been taught. So the sheer scale of these, of these challenges is just enormous. But we are at an exciting period. We are an exciting period. The scale of change is the investment challenge, despite the economy, despite where we are today, the amount of investment in the energy industry in the UK is enormous. £250 billion between now and 2020. And we do need to get on with it, otherwise the economy will not thrive. But that does need a huge number of new people coming into the industry. They're mostly highly skilled, they're mostly science, technology, engineering and maths based. But we've got to equip the young of today and inspire them to come into jobs that are hugely satisfying and create lives in, in the future that at the moment, as you heard from, from Francis, they just can't see their way through. The demand's there and the supply is there. We're just not joining up in the way that we need to. And we can't afford to fail. We can't afford to fail for business and we can't afford to fail for society. And the responsibility sits very clearly, as far as I'm concerned, on business to take a lead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. I've just come back actually from chairing a conference which was focusing on the International Year of Chemistry, and we had businesses from all around the world, similar challenge, that they've got some amazing opportunities out there because there's some huge challenges when it comes to green technology and the way that the chemical industry, science and engineering, can help economies around the world get out of the trouble we're in at the moment where they haven't got those skills base and the impression I was getting from that conference and here as well that it's down to those schools and those teacher trainers in particular what are they doing at the moment to change that perception of science technology and maths when they're going through their teacher training courses and I've got the utmost respect for teachers but there's no input from businesses into those teacher training colleges then you're churning out the same old stuff year in, year out. So how can we make science, engineering, maths, fun, engaging, practical, but relevant to today? That's the great question, isn't it? And, that, I, I, and I think the answer is, I think the answer is, the business has got to get more involved in this. It's very easy to sit outside, and I have done it myself, mm. and said, you teachers need to understand what business does. Mm. Find out and help mm. explain to the kids. It's rather unfair. Yeah. Business has to work a lot more with teachers, actually. Mm. So we run open days for teachers. Mm. We get about 500 a year through mm. to show them what children will do with the qualifications that they're going. And trying to, again, go back to, as you heard earlier, I'm, I'm, I'm doing maths. When am I ever going to use maths? Mm. Explaining just what you then do with it in mm. the future mm. and linking it back mm. is just key. But also, there's a, there's a big issue on science, technology, engineering, and maths that people say, mm. it's hard work. Mm. It's tough, actually. So what's the prize? So being very clear about, there's some fantastic jobs at the end of this. And one of the things that I'm finding in our industry today, as kids are so concerned about the climate and the environment, actually come and do a job that makes a real difference. Yeah. Come and help fix these problems that you're interested in. And therefore, it's worth you continuing your studies. 
And it's good that you said that, tying it in with some very practical things where they're recycling at school and they understand those issues and just matching those up with business as well. You've got a ready-made workforce of the future, one hopes. Business has got to do a lot more. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Looking forward to seeing you on the panel. Steve Holliday, everybody. Thank you. Well, before we um, start the panel discussion, we have one final presentation. I'm delighted to say Terry Morgan is our next presenter. He's been chairman of Crossrail since June 2009. Now, Crossrail is a £15 billion project. I think I've added it up a little bit, just going up to gone up by maybe 100,000, designed to deliver a world-class affordable railway linking sizable areas around London and beyond. And you can read in the programme exactly the extent to which Crossrail will cover. Terry ha also has a number of board positions, including the London Skills and Employment Board, Manufacturing Technology Centre, which I think is based up in Coventry, the National Skills Academy for Railway Engineering, as well as being president of an organisation I'm also a fellow of. Yes, we have the Chartered Management Institute president here with us today, and here to talk about not just building a railway, but building a workforce and the skills and challenges that Crossrail face. Please give a very warm welcome to Terry Morgan, CBE. I had to get the charter okay. management. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> uh, morning, everybody. Um, following Steve, I, I have to say that there is a fairly strong engineering theme this morning. I make no, no apologies for that. And um, I can't tell you how enlightening it is for me just to listen to people talk about the importance of apprentices. I was an apprentice. I suspect 10 years ago, I might have mumbled that, actually. Now, today, it's something I think as we recognize this economy has to reshape itself, it has to really look at where value creation comes from, recognize what we already have in terms of the systems that exist, but the importance of recognizing that we could do so much more if we had a much more balanced workforce to meet the future demands of this economy. There we go. Nadine did a little bit for me in terms of my um, opening gambit really, which is that I want to use Crossrail as a model of what's possible. Uh, it's at its very early formative stages. It's really been through a huge amount of uh, planning approvals. It's been through a big debate about the importance of infrastructure investment and whether an economy in its current state can afford to expend the best part of uh, 15 billion pounds. 14.8 is the exact number but that's a funding capacity and our expectation is that we can certainly do it for less if we have the right skills and capability. It adds 10% more capacity to public transport in London. It's 120 kilometers long. It's a very big train set that we're going to deliver and it starts being provided in 2018 in terms of completion of this project. It is the largest infrastructure project in Europe. It has 20 kilometers of tunnel drives in the central section going through the heartland of the city. It's 40 meters deep, and um, you heard a presentation from Steve in terms of National Grid. He's got a lot of assets down there too. So is the underground, so is EDF, so is Thames Water. And of course, there's a history and the legacy of London to cope with in terms of recognizing there's an awful lot down there that we've been working very hard to understand exactly what is there. But as Nadine said, this is about delivering a key infrastructure project, but the determination is that there should be a legacy in terms of skills. I'm going to touch a little bit more on Tunnel Academy in just a couple of minutes. And at Wallasey, we're building a bird reserve in, in conjunction with the Royal Society for Protection of Birds. It's a 150-acre site, a huge site where we will be removing much of the spoil from our tunnels and actually then, in sustainable terms, creating a bird reserve in the estuary of the Thames. In terms of the benefits that Crossrail will bring, it's as an east-west route. And I think the key thing is if you look at things like uh, Heathrow to Canary Wharf, it reduces the travel time from just over 70 minutes to just over 40. It's a hugely complex project and in the central section interfaces with many of the existing stations that you will be familiar with. And if I use as an example, I always think Paddington Station, when this is completed, is going to be the signature station for Crossrail. 
it will combine the very best of Brunel and what you see there is the old station that we will work with and what you see at the front is the infrastructure work we have to do to create a new station. If you're familiar with Paddington, that uh, Crossrail underground station that you see there is where the current taxi rank is. We're moving it. I apologize if you use that station regularly for the disruption we are causing you, but I find myself right now apologizing to lots of different sites across the middle of London because we're very, very busy starting to get ourselves ready. I said it's a very big project. One of my favorite sites, this isn't my favorite sh uh, shot necessarily, this is center point. I'm often a point of discussion about its, um, its values, but it's there and it's there to stay. There's a station already at Tottenham Court Road that services the northern line and the central line on the underground, busy station, and right now, London Underground are doing some work in terms of congestion relief. I have to say, all these shots you just have to imagine are underground, they're not on the surface. That's what uh, is already planned and is underway at Tottenham Court Road. And then Crossrail happens. And that's what we're doing to Tottenham Court Road. That's a billion pound of expenditure. It's a huge undertaking. And if you could imagine at the same time, we have to make sure that London doesn't lock up because we're taking out absolutely essential uh, capacity in terms of transport. We, we have a huge challenge and a huge engineering challenge to ensure that we can do this on time, on budget, and we do need, desperately need, some very, very special skills to make sure that that's done in the right way. Tunnel boring machines are on contract right now and are being delivered at the end of 2011 for startup in the first quarter of 2012 and will continue through to 2015. But let me come on to the theme of the conference today. Um, as I said right at the beginning, Crossrail is a relatively immature organization. We currently employ just over 2,000 people. By 2013, we will employ just under 15,000 people. So a huge recruitment program required from the supply chain. We also reckon the supply chain impact of this project is about three to one. So we're talking about 50 to 60,000 new jobs being created on this project. But in an industry that I have to recognize has a, an aging UK workforce, it's a consequence of the stop-start um, policy that we've had with infrastructure investment that many, many companies have relied on immigration to actually meet the skills and needs that a project of this nature requires. It's also using very advanced technologies, and like Steve said, that's where the excitement comes from. It is, has huge potential to create the opportunity for a very long career for people and to actually feel they're at the cutting edge of technology. The training provisions are very limited. Uh, a lot of informal training, but if you're a very immature organization, you don't have any informal training. You are trying to recruit it. There's a lack of accredited training and learning and training programs. The quality of new entrants has been a challenge. We're spending a great deal of time, as I know many other employers are, to try and bridge the gap between what we expect, what we need, and what we're dealing with. And in terms of that requirement, in terms of training, again, we are very much looking at people with experience to help us with the skills and, and training that we need to put in place. Our strategy is based on absolutely critically a safety regime is important, vitally important to anybody who works in our industry. We want to inspire talent to come into our sector. The project is London based. It is also funded very much on a UK basis, so our intention is not to rely on immigration, but to look at how we can ensure that we actually, from a local point of view, um, you heard Sir Robin Wales talk earlier, I'll touch on how we're trying to respond positively to, for example, the Newham agenda, but the opportunities for local labor is very, very real. And for example, on uh, the work we're doing on tunneling, um, there are just 500 tunnelers in the UK. I need well in excess of 500. Steve needs some, um, so do uh, Thames Water, so do EDF. There is a huge capacity need going forward that we just have to make sure we can match. We have a young Crossrail program, youngsters at school where we're trying to reach out to half a million school children. 
And uh, in that regard, just like many, many employers, we're trying to help people prepare for the world of work with work experience programs. That's just an idea. I'm, forgive me for uh, making this a very pretty looking chart, but it's just a skills mix of what we're looking for. We're not looking for a generic all embracing skill set. We're looking for people from very, very different vocational backgrounds to help feed this rapid increase in employment that we're looking for. And I mentioned just in London, this is a map of London. Uh, these are just some of the projects that are planned over the next five years that will require the same skill set that we're looking for at Crossrail. And it's why in that regard, we very often in skills terms don't talk about Crossrail skills, we talk about skills legacy that we expect to be able to see and help support the infrastructure agenda that we're, we're going through right now. We have built a Italian Academy in Newham. And uh, it borders on to uh, Ilford. It's a, an area of um, enormous opportunity, but it's also one with uh, huge challenges in terms of social deprecation. We are very proud of the fact we've built it. We invested 15 million pound in it. It opened last week. So we're in a bit of a, you can imagine, an accelerated program to make sure that we maximize what we can do in terms of preparation for next year in terms of tunneling. We will accredit 1,000 people a year to go through this facility. There is no such other facility in the UK. If you wanted to be trained to actually work on tunneling, you went to Switzerland. So again, this is a very, as far as I'm concerned, world-class but a national standard that we're trying to create for skills. Sorry for the anagrams, but the National Skills Academy for Railway Engineering will also be based at our Tunneling Underground Construction Academy. We're establishing apprenticeship frameworks. We're into pre-employment training. And there's also a need for us ensuring that as we go forward, the skill set changes as we start building the new stations in the central sections. So, in conclusion, conclusion, I just wanted to touch on a, a few things that I just wanted to try and emphasize. Crosswell will be recruiting 400 apprentices. We work in an environment where one in five, only one in five, employers recruit apprentices. In London, it's 3% of employers employ apprentices. You have to, if you're an employer, you have to, in my opinion, you have to take very positive action. If you want to work on a cross-world project and your contract's worth more than three million, you will commit to recruit apprentices. If you don't, you will not get a contract from us. And I do think it's really, really important that we actually demonstrate leadership. The skills, as I said, um, is something that we're very driven to meet. We are ready for the uh, infrastructure agenda. There is a huge investment coming from the public sector into this investment, huge contribution coming from London, both in terms of business and those who live in London. And we have a duty to make sure that not only do we build this railway on time, but that we leave a legacy in terms of skills. Thank you. Thank you very much, Terry. I know you started life out as an apprentice, and you think about the role models today, the young people are sold a bit of a pup, really, aren't they? That they've got overpaid footballers to look up to. The only way is Essex, if you um, watch television at all, and also overpaid pop stars, television celebrities. So who do you say is your hero that you look up to today, those young heroes coming through that really rolled up their sleeves and got on with the job? Um, I, actually, I mean, yeah, it's my apprentices, actually. I can only tell you that um, I, I've experienced where you have to create opportunities to celebrate and to s extend the celebration to when there are opportunities, for example, many apprenticeships, the sort that we described earlier, they're indentured, you have an opportunity to present a certificate that says as an employer you are committed to actually ensure that they get their training. If you don't do it, do it. If you do do it, make sure you don't just do it with the youngsters involved invite their families and just watch them pride. Mm -hmm. And when you tell them, as I do, I was an apprentice, you just watch the el elbows start flapping from the parents to their children. You can do it if you have the determination. And I, mm -hmm. For me, if you spend the time with apprentices, I can't tell you how much you get back from mm -hmm. them.
Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Terry. You're going to be joining the panel discussion, so rather than leaving the stage, thank if I can you. get you to take up four. your spot, you're number four. I am. You, that, that's fantastic. Okay. And I'd like to welcome back to the stage Francis O'Grady, Christine Hodgson, and Steve Holliday to join Terry Morgan. And also introducing onto the panel, please welcome up Nick Bradley, Group Director of City and Guilds. We've got Christine Gaskell, Member of the Board for Personnel with Bentley, Sir Peter Rogers and joining us all on the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Round of applause, please, for our panelists. And number five. Well, thank you very much for joining us. If I can just turn, first of all, to our three new panelists who've um, just joined us. And um, Nick, obviously, Group Director, City and Guilds, and City and Guilds is the UK's leading vocational awarding organisation, overseeing brand and customer experience development, market activation, digital strategy and strategic partnerships. It sounds like you've got an incredibly busy job there. Just want to find out first of all, what do you think is and isn't working with the current UK education system? Yes, good morning. Um, interesting question. Uh, there's quite a few things really. I mean, I want to focus on, I mean, apprenticeships are working. Um, that's something that we've found particularly over the last 12 months and, uh, and we've certainly got behind um, you know, the government agenda around that. Um, I think they're working for a number of different reasons, but um, the main thing really is that uh, they do allow people to come into the workforce to get employment. And with so many challenges that are out there at the moment in terms of higher uh, you know, university fees, um, lack of information, advice and guidance that are coming through schools, there's this real sort of shining beacon around apprenticeships, which give that opportunity for employers to really get involved and come and inspire learners. So that's something that's really, really working. Um, what's not working, I think, though, is um, there still needs to be more work done around the, the government to, to help with reducing some of the red tape that exists, particularly for small and medium-sized employers, to get behind apprenticeships. You know, we go out there and speak to employers a, a lot these days, and what they're saying to us is that, um, you know, we want to get involved, but we need more information and we need some understanding about reducing the complexity. And I think if those two things can be married up together, then, you know, the opportunity will um, still increase. And is the voice of City and Girls being respected out there? Are you finding you're getting a, a bigger audience now listening to those concerns? We see our role, we say a lot that our role is around collaboration actually, mm -hmm. working with um, you know, lots of uh, further education colleges, training providers, employers and learners to sort of bring together that, that world, if you like, around the opportunity. We launched a campaign in February this year called Million Extra, uh, which was around helping the government hit the 2015 targets around apprenticeship places. But it's not just around the numbers, and it was made, the point was made earlier today, it's also about the quality. Mm. And I think actually more needs to be done around raising awareness, challenging the brand of apprenticeships, because you know, it's not just the fact that um, you know, they, they can be considered second class or lower class, it's also the fact that um, you know, these, these are great opportunities. Mm. And more and more employers can get behind, I think, the fact that you know, if you can go and join a big company like Capgemini, you can go in through and, and end up in the same place as someone who's gone through university, that is fantastic, but the awareness of that is not high enough yet. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And I also would like to welcome Christine Gaskell as well. Uh, Christine, you've been a member of the Board for Personnel of Bentley since 1995, and I know involved in the motor industry for almost of your working life, which uh, sounds fascinating, and responsible for nearly 4,000 employees worldwide, a champion for apprenticeships, and acts as ambassador for the National Apprenticeship Service in the Northwest. Uh, good morning to you. Obviously, we've talked about too many young people are in that neat category that they're not in employment, education, or training. And that looks like it's going to get a lot worse as well. And even those graduates who have decided to go to university are finding themselves that there isn't a job at the end of their courses. In fact, they're saddled with debt instead. So what are Bentley doing in particular to address this issue and encourage young people into the workforce, give them that positive start in life? Well, there are three examples I can give you. Um, first of all, like some of the speakers um, who spoke earlier, we're doing an awful lot with schools, and we go in at primary school to actually explain what the world of work is all about. So we're working with five, six-year-olds, and that's across the whole of South Cheshire to, and our, all our local schools, right the way through, because we find an awful lot of, of um, the, um, schools and colleges, they just don't understand what our, the world, our world of work is all about. Secondly, we're, we're just embarking on... Um, uh, working with uh, Job, Center, uh, Job Center Plus to see if we can develop a program for the long-term unemployed to work with our apprentices to actually explain to long-term unemployed who don't understand how you even get into the world of work, how, our, how did our apprentices get there? Now, if we can get our apprentices who are the same age to explain to them, this is what I had to do, um, and we're trying to put a program together. It's in its very early stages at the moment, but I'm quite excited about that. I think that could be really, really interesting. 
And finally, um, we've had a 300% increase in um, applications for our apprenticeship schemes this year. And what we are trying to do is introduce more um, higher level apprentices because actually lots of young people now see that this is a really positive alternative to going to university. So more and more high level apprenticeships are definitely going to be in Bentley. Well, that sounds very positive. And I'd also like to welcome Peter Rogers, who's advisor to the Mayor's Office for Regeneration, Growth and Enterprise in the Greater London Authority. I know Peter's worked for the last 15 years in the public sector, um, including being CEO of the London Development Agency and prior to that CEO of Westminster City Council. Welcome to you. First of all, can I just find out what exactly the Mayor and the GLA are doing to support the skills required for new and emerging sectors? Uh, before you deal with what we're doing with skills, I think it's important to recognise the scale of the problem. We've had a huge number of years of growth and London still has 30% unemployment. So the, the balance and the mix of skills is really important in London. And the focus on apprenticeships is worthwhile, but you have to focus on a much wider group who have the ability to pull their potential. And I'll pick up one comment, which is um, what is really needed in terms of policy and delivery. I think it's about improving the wiring across the agencies. Um, we, as a group, owe it to every individual to give them the chance to fulfill their aspiration and their potential. And if we can get the mix between business, the mix between uh, procurement, the mix between training and get skills out of schools in the right shape and the right framework to fulfill the future, then that gives us a chance. So the mayor's job is really simple. Um, he has to create jobs, um, he has to develop skills, and he has to deal with growth in London and make sure that that flows through to London's population. And that's my job. And we will be opening up to the audience in about five or so minutes, so I will be coming for questions. Um, Francis, if I can bring you back in again. Um, often there's a perception that unions obviously just represent the narrow interests of their members. How are they going to change that perception, change public awareness in particular, and become advocates for that wider skills agenda rather than just the members, so you're appealing to the general public as well? Because I think that's a huge challenge for you. Well, I think we are key players in the skills debate. Um, but at a very practical level uh, of our hundreds of workplace learning centres, many of them are open to the community. The one that we've got on the Olympic site with the support of the Olympic Authority and many, many employers working on site uh, not only serves the workforce building the Olympics and then running them, but also we take computers out to the local shore start centre, the fire station, the emergency services, the transport workers in the area, and their families are all getting opportunities too and I think we've made a, a real difference to some of uh, the workers who are most in need of skills mm -hmm. in particular for example working very closely with G4S on security workers skills um, many of the migrant workers with needs for English as a second language as well as literacy and numeracy too but I think I was very interested to pick up on one other point I think you're absolutely right that we need to use that around 160 billion pounds worth of procurement power that government has, and we need to use it wisely. It would make a huge difference uh, to the last train manufacturer in Britain if we were using that purchasing power to keep those thousands of workers in work, including many apprentices, and of course the many more thousands of workers down the supply chain who stand to lose out, not just skills, but livelihoods. And Christine, if I can bring you in as well, I mean, global companies as such as Capgemini surely don't have allegiances for any particular nation, whether it's the UK, whoever it is, and are driven only really by economic imperatives rather than workers migrating. So isn't it that business will do the migrating to find the skilled or potentially skilled? If you can't find them here, eventually you're going to have to go off and find them elsewhere. It, that's absolutely right. Um, and, and also, of course, in an industry like, like ours, um, our customers on a day-to-day -day basis put us under increasing pressure from a cost point of view to deliver more and more and deliver it for less, less cost. And so, you know, all the time you've got to be more creative. And if we can't find the right skills onshore at the right, uh, um, at the right basically at the right cost, then you've no alternative but to go and find the skills, whether it's you know in India, in Vietnam, etc. So, 
so uh, you know, one, one of the things we're trying to do at the moment is create what we're calling low-cost onshore centres in areas perhaps of more deprivation, where particularly where we've got contracts and long-term contracts work together with the, with the client and say, let's create jobs and create them over a sustainable period. Um, and, and obviously with the government's help where possible. And I think that's the way to do it. You have to be more creative. Otherwise, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's an imperative from, um, on the demand side saying, move, you know, if, if you can't find the skills at the right price, then yeah, take them offshore, which is um, quite dangerous in, in the long term. So. Mm. And Steve, you raised an interesting point about you know, making apprentices vocational training, so making it well known that it's not just about those narrow fields that so many parents think about. And I know Chris Humphreys, uh, who's the chairman of World Skills London, has often said when he stood up in front of people and said, who here wants to be an apprentice who wants their son or daughter? Out of 100, you may only get four or five. So it's parents in a way, and as having two children myself, I'm in a very, very influential position of where I can steer my children to. And we've been given that message that universities are the key thing, that's what you need to go, and look what's happened. It's sold the country short. So what can we do about engaging parents? Well, this is a subject I've thought about a great deal, actually, because you, because you go back and say, well, what do they understand today, and how have they got that understanding? You've got that understanding through first-hand experience often, but you can't put that in place and it's not there. And then you're into the media, of course. And the power of the media is just frightening. I mean, your own comments around you know, on pop stars mm. and footballers and mm. everything else, etc. So there is some work going on, actually, to try and encourage a number of media companies to start to run uh, more programmes around what people do and explain it, and not in a documentary sense, but actually make it quite exciting. Of course, The Apprentice is a little sin thin, mm. inappropriate slither, I think, about what business is all about. Mm. But, it, but it is about getting out there and, mm. and explaining. And the only way I think you can do that is through the media somehow. Otherwise, it's just going to take generations. Mm. But as Terry said, there are lots of role models around. There really are. So what business needs to do is get into schools. That's the real place where you're clearly talking with the customer, if you will, mm. aren't you? Uh, and taking lots of role models and explaining what people do and painting their career paths as well. There's this great assumption today, unfortunately, that there is route one and it's route one or nothing. Mm -hmm. And it's just not true today. It's not about the future. It's not even true today, actually. Demystifying it and clarifying that is just, is just a big challenge. It's back to, I think, us all doing more. Mm. And Terry, obviously, we've already talked about you started your working life as an apprentice. I mean, does that give you, do you think, a different insight into the practical leadership skills that you need? And, and in a way, you talked about the challenge of getting those apprentices, but at least you know what it's like you've started out there and you know those challenges firsthand. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I, I would never hold myself up in that regard as a, a role model, other than trying to explain to people that wherever you start from, uh, the, your own potential is the key and how you, you know, there are some examples quoted today of people who have helped themselves. But I do think as employers we have a responsibility to make sure that people recognize they have those opportunities and again uh, there will be many employers in this room who will have a great apprenticeship scheme and there will be those who feel they're doing it out of duty. The ones who are doing it out of duty are missing out the opportunity and, the, and I, I don't worry to be frank with you about companies that train up apprentices and they leave. My experience is that those who leave don't leave because there's something better over there. It's because they haven't been looked after properly by the employer. Mm. Um, my experience is you invest in these young people and uh, you get back the loyalty mm. that you put into the investment. Mm. And it's, it, it is a partnership. It's not mm. term, thinking that you're sending people through an apprenticeship, therefore they have an ob obligation to stay in that job for the next 10 years, 15 years. Mm. Those days are gone. Mm. The young people have to have the ambition about what they can do to develop their careers. And I, you know, for me, that's where I think I can help with that, um, my own experience. And Vince talked about the return on investment. It's paid back pretty quickly, actually. I think he quoted a three-year figure for, for one section. I don't know if those figures concur with your views. Oh, it's a great investment. And do you know what? The other part of the investment is you talk to your employees and they're so proud of the fact that you yeah. have an apprenticeship program that brings young people into the business. I mean, there's, there's a win-win in all of this if you do it properly. Okay. Well, would you like to ask a question of the panel? And as your golden opportunity, you've been waiting there very patiently. This lady put her hand up straight away, so it'd only be, be rude of me not to go to you. We've got a microphone coming your way. If you can say the name and the organisation you represent, and we're looking for questions that are quite succinct. 
Hi, I'm Tina Kumar, and I'm representing the Edge Learner Forum, and that's just trying to promote vocational training within like businesses and working with other campaigns. I'd just like to ask that now, like technology and social media are becoming like really advanced, and young people are more interested in that than thinking about their careers, like some of them, like careers and like how to get to work. So I was thinking that what could like businesses do in order to work with like the schools as well as young people to make these opportunities like such as apprenticeships be more exciting and approachable to young people and how you can use that perhaps like making an app for young people to be able to go out so they can download it and be able to access these opportunities. Yeah, great question. And Nick, I'd imagine from City and yeah. Guilds, you, you've, <laughs> you've really got to rethink your marketing strategy. That, that, Marketing approach you had 10 years ago is probably being ripped up as these yeah. new social media <laughs> technology. Definitely. It's yeah. a really good question, actually, and um, it's something that we've been looking at quite extensively at the moment. If you uh, visit a couple of the stands that we have here at World Schools, we have a, a thing called Hello Future that we launched, which is a very, 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 very simple thing, which people can sort of look at different career options and find out local colleges in their area where they can go and get more information. And that's just one small way of using social media. And obviously we're using um, Facebook and those sort of things. But we've been talking to a few companies recently and a few partnerships around careers advice and guidance because for me personally and, and spending lots of time um, going out there speaking to 14 to 19 year olds, there's a real missing link here in terms of the information that's provided to them and the opportunities that they can, they can go on and take. And a statistic that we recently did around VQ Day was that um, something like 70% of 14 to 19 year olds, we, we surveyed 1,000, um, were saying they were getting advice around uh, going to university but less than 50% were hearing about apprenticeships and vocational pathways. Huge, huge problem. Um, we spoke with a company recently called Cragrats. Some of you may know who they are. Um, and they have a really interesting model, um, a model that we want to test and we may do something with in the future, where uh, they go into schools and they use theatre to inspire around different um, career options. And then there was a really interesting social media hub that was being created through them, which would link to employers into local, local areas and try and drive some level of work inspiration, work experience, from that inspiration that was created at the school itself. So I think, yeah, there's got to be much more to be done, and I think it's definitely a movement on from connections and some of the other advice and guidance models that have been used in the past. Anybody else with a comment? Yeah, Francis. So what uh, young people tell us is that they are desperate for more information, and often their parents are too. The National Apprenticeship Service has done a really good job uh, in terms of their website, trying to create a portal for all apprenticeships in Britain. But at the moment, employers aren't required to advertise on it. And what young people want is to know not just what the starting pay is, but where will they end up? Uh, you know, what are the opportunities? And six years ago, because I think this is really important in terms of young women mm -hmm. and some of the figures that we heard that haven't changed over decades, still only 1%, 2% of engineers, car mechanics, and so on, uh, are young women. Well. The Equal Opportunities Commission carried out a formal investigation six years ago and they found from their research amongst young women that around half of them would have made a different choice uh, to the one that they made instead of going into traditional areas like hairdressing had they known what the pay was. And this is a really basic point but it is something we've got to talk about because we know that those apprenticeships that have the best pay tend to have the best quality training. Mm. Young people are more likely to stick at it and they're mm. more likely to stay mm. and get a good job at the end of it. So that's, we need all apprenticeships to come yeah. up to that standard. And you said as I'd be transparent about that career yeah. path and what you can earn the as well. Media is really yeah. important in doing that. Great question. Can I take another question? Um, gentleman there, please. Good morning to you. Again, if you can say your name and your organization. Okay, my name is John Smith and uh, I'm a consultant with MEGT, with, which is a, a major Australian training company, which is now active in, the, in, in England, uh, developing apprenticeships, so bringing skills over, over to England and its experience. My question is about protecting the apprenticeship brand in the context of the Secretary of State's commitment to this very, very large expansion of apprenticeships. We've heard some very, very inspirational presentations from the stage, um, very inspirational from, from the private sector. What they have in common is they, they're in high quality, high skill areas. And there's anecdotal evidence that not all apprenticeships are in those sorts of areas. Yeah. 
And we've also heard how important is the image, the branding of apprenticeships, which I absolutely agree with. How does the panel feel we can protect that brand, that image, in the light and the context of the, uh, the government's drive for expansion, which won't be just in high, high quality, high tech areas? Great question. Terry. Hmm. That's a great, I, I can't tell you how pleased I was this morning listening to the Secretary of State talk about not just numbers but about quality. Um, I've been made aware that there are some apprenticeship programs that last six weeks. Who are you kidding? Um, for me that is damaging the brand. Equally I have to say that I could damage the brand by saying, I, I, back to Christine's example, I took five years to do my apprenticeship. It was time based. It wasn't, skill, wasn't a competency based, time based. And so, I think we do have to recognize that there has to be variability and I think it's the whole question about competency, competency standards that we're trying to achieve and to make sure those frameworks are in place. If they're not, then I do fear that the brand is at risk. Steve? Well, I, I agree with the point. I worry about it as well, actually. I, and I think what's going on here is to try and put some, some grading in there between a basic, higher and advanced and be very clear. There's a huge difference and Terry's absolutely right. Six weeks apprenticeship to just learn to do a simple job and three years of, or four years of very hard work to become incredibly highly skilled and very highly paid as well. We need to get that out there. And the brand is a bit damaged because it's just used as a catch-all. There's a lot of work going on, I do think. I think, I think go and understand that about, you need to be clear about exactly what you're talking about. It's back to these targets, isn't it though? Let's get a million. Well, you know, if you do that, you say, let's get a million. It's not a million, actually. 500,000 top quality would be better than a million low quality. So being very clear about what the real aims are is something we've just got to get a bit smarter about in this country. Okay, comment from Peter. Uh, I think you really need to look at the objective of what we're trying to achieve and where apprentices are important. And where apprenticeships really work are where they are important to the culture, values, and ethos of the companies. So if you get that right, and if you do that right, you protect the brand. And this isn't a simple increased regulation, make sure it works argument. This is about embedding the value of what you are trying to achieve in companies' thoughts. And one of the easy things, and we've all seen it over time, is we've started to say degrees aren't important. Lazy HR departments will do a SIP of 1,000 applications on the basis of 2 1, 2 2, or 3. And then they will go to the 2 1s and then they will start doing them and then they tire. So if you really believe this, the culture, the values, and the operating model of each company really matters. And it's not about size, it's not about scope, it's about the values and living them every day in an organization. And I think that's the real challenge. That's how you protect brand, that's how you make them worthwhile. And coming back to the social media point, if you do it badly, it won't be what we put on the social network that will say it's bad. Mm. Reputations will be damaged mm. by the people who go on to bad training. Great question. Christine, if I can get a comment from yeah, you as well. I, I, I think it's a great question. I, I think it's, it is certainly in our sector about getting national, um, it's about getting the recognition, so some sort of standards. There's the balance, of course, of not increasing the bureaucracy too much. That, um, would turn organizations off doing it but I think it's about having something so that everybody knows you know this apprenticeship means this and it's, it's got a gold standard that that, 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 that carries and I, and I think it will just have to be about certain guidelines um, uh, that will need to be in place and, and hopefully that they won't be a turn off because um, obviously Chris, thank you Christine and the other Christine you've talked about the increase in the amount of apprenticeships you've had but obviously that the quality one would hope would still be just as high as before. Absolutely, absolutely. if not better. Mm. You constantly look to how you can improve that standard. Standards are the key to it, but hey, why are we here? Mm. This is about the brand, about mm. world skills. Mm. It's about saying, this is the best, this is mm. a showcase, mm. this is aspirational, this is what young people need. Mm. Great. Any other questions, please? Gentleman there, who is very forthright with his hand up, and standing up now as well, to help <laughs> with the microphone. There we go, it's behind you. Uh, Good morning, everybody. My name is David Edwards. I'm Chief Executive of the Engineering Construction Industry Training Board. I can actually answer the previous question in part to help the panel. The government in the UK has introduced statutory 
regulatory compliance requirements for apprenticeships to deliberately underpin the standards of apprenticeships and you can't get funding for an apprenticeship unless it meets standards mm -hmm. and there's a regulatory framework driven through the sector skills councils and organizations like mine mm -hmm. i want to applaud the uh, commitment demonstrated on the audience and i can say that the careers work in schools with theater does work we've been doing it for the last five years Steve, you said you've got to join up. I see lots of fragmented and lacking coherent behavior be between the different sectors. How do we get different sectors who pull from the same skill base to actually use common standards and portability and pull together? Anyone in particular you wanted the question directed at? I think particularly the engineering, I've got to say that from okay. an engineering perspective, but the cross rail, the, the national grid, the power infrastructure industries are all fishing in the same pool yeah. at the moment yeah. and sending mixed messages to the vast number of people. Yeah. We actually oversubscribe by a factor of five to one for apprenticeships yeah. uh, each year. We offer about a thousand annually. So there is demand from young people for these, but the bottleneck is getting them into the mm. work placement. And Terry's uh, already mentioned about... Some, yeah. I'd love some help with that. Okay, lovely. Thank you Thank very much. You. And Terry's already mentioned about the fact that there is that demand from lots of other organisations after the same pool as well. Oh. Oh, you're asking, right. Um, can, I, can I be slightly challenging? I, I, my own view is that there are too many sector skills competing with each other. Uh, we've got, I think, well over 20. And in my business, I have to face off to different sector skills in terms of competencies that I need. I think at the end of the day, on a project like mine, I can do it because it's large enough, I can determine what I think are the right competency sets and I will choose in order to make sure that I have the skills that will deliver the project. But it's, I, I do hope, over time, that we have a sector skill body, and I've, you know, I've had this discussion with many other people before, that reflects the economy as we have it today, and not based on, sometimes it feels as though it's a very historical relationship in terms of skills. We need something that's relevant to the economy. As I said earlier, the, uh, the, there is a determination to try and change the shape of this economy, to bring more emphasis on value uh, on value engineering and I think the whole question then about making sure that our skills development supports that drive to reshape the economy is critically important. I know the UKCS is looking at this in terms of how better, so I, I do personally hope that there will be a better fit for where the economy is and sometimes what the sector skills are. I don't want sector skills competing with each other, which as you know sometimes does happen. Not good for anyone. I, I wholly agree with that. I, I think the point I was trying to make, and I'll try and make it again, um, maybe slightly more articulately, is if you just think back to the way that I was certainly educated, you know, there were, there were real silos. So you think about the science subjects, you know, there's chemistry, physics, maths. Work's not like that. These things all cross over, actually. Nanoscience, biology, creativity coming into engineering and science. But one of the things which is about the future, not about the past, actually, so one of the things we're trying to do in some of the schools is help some of the some of the teachers who are teaching those subjects to broaden outside of their syllabus and say, yeah, but energy doesn't fit into this. Yes, but the sort of jobs that are in there require little bits of knowledge across all of this spectrum. So can we help give you some projects that break some of these barriers and silos down and see there's a relationship across all of the STEM agenda? It's just scratching the surface, I agree, but it, I think it gets into the core skills of your organisation as well. You know, the old, that's what we need, is just not going to be there in the future, is it? It's going to be much more grey, far less b b black and white. So how can we all start to move to that ambiguity a bit faster? Thank you. Okay, we're going to get final comments now because we need to wrap up. So we haven't got time for the last question. Maybe you can ask it personally after us as well. I just want to get a final comment from all the panellists before we move off again. Uh, so Peter Rogers, if I can start with you. Obviously, London is a great city of opportunity and success, but not everybody benefits. So just final thoughts, really, from you as to how we can share that great success out more evenly and equitably as well. I think London is a great city. We've heard about the Olympics, we've heard about the Enterprise Zone, we've heard about Crossrail, we've heard about tube enhancements. Um, it's still a magnet for the world. Um, half of the skills are above degree. That's not the constituent model for the population. So we will continue with inward migration for jobs, but there must be wealth trickling down through communities. And that means continual development of skills. It just, doesn't just mean apprentices it means in organization skills 
and it means different skills, mentoring from business to develop secondary and tertiary sectors, and I think there's a real opportunity for London's growth to filter through all its communities. And Christian Gaskell obviously been a big advocate at Bentley for world skills. I met your team over in Calgary a couple of years ago and I know a big advocate again for London and, and trying to spread that word across all of the devolved nations, in particular up in the northwest. Final thoughts you'd like to impart with the audience as to you know, what they can do when they go back from listening today of how they can make a real difference. Well, I think, look, at World Skills has been a tremendous um, experience for us. Calgary, we had a competitor there. It was wonderful. As a result of that, it was just a no-brainer for us that we were going to support World Skills here. I'd say to all companies, look at this. Look at, look, look at actually getting your pe young people to think that they can be the best, to actually think that they are going to you know, be the Olympics mm -hmm. of, of, of skills. And I think that you've got to actually create... Um, opportunities where you know you can take young people on and really make them feel that they are the best that they can be and Nick building on from that how important are events like world skills for the future of vocational education and skills um, they're crucial um, but you know our view is you know the five-day event is really just a symbol of that um, you know and, and spending a few days walking around and seeing you know these young people so inspired and so good at what they do it's what we do here now and actually you know across the globe to sort of take that forward. So for me, it's more about the legacy. Mm. It's what happens, you know, in the schools. Mm. Um, it's what employers do when they leave this, this, um, this fantastic event after being inspired and seeing mm. how that can, you know, adapt into their workplace and making sure that this doesn't become something that is just the event. Mm. Yeah. And we certainly, from Sydney Gill's perspective, we want to drive it harder mm. and we want to be involved in it. But so it becomes something more annual mm. as opposed to something which is just, you know, mm. every couple of years spread around the country. And sitting on the board, obviously, 50% was the event, but the other side of it was the legacy, which is a major concern. You think, oh, what a wonderful event, great opening, closing ceremony, mm. but it's got to be so much more than that because we haven't done our job. If you go back to Helsinki, I think, 2005, who've done a lot of work in this, I think over 40% more people started to look into education and training as a result of going to World Skills Helsinki. We need to be getting figures like that as well. Absolutely. There's a lot to be done Absolutely. there. Thank you. Um, if I can turn to Terry as well, how confident are you, because you talked about the requirements that you need, that you're going to be able to mobilise the skill sets that you need to meet all of Crossrail's needs? Uh, how confident I am? Um, I'm not confident yet. Um, the mobilisation that we have to go through is huge. I think we've put the right building blocks in place, but we just have to, have to have the determination. I mentioned, for example, we've placed an obligation on our supply chain for three billion pounds worth of contract, you will have an apprentice. That's been tried before, and some contractors will do it extremely well. Some will see this as just saying yes, but not meaning yes. Our determination is that this, given the agenda that we have in the UK right now, on the vocational skills agenda, we just have to deliver it. Part of my commitment is to make sure that those who feel that they have a choice are told very clearly there is no choice. We have to get the skills agenda going forward, and that's how we're going to meet the skills requirements. So a lot of hard work still to be done. And obviously representing National Grid, but widening out to the, the whole of the industry, private sector and public sector, what do we need to do to really improve the image and draw more young people into science, maths, engineering? I know we've touched on this before, but that final thing that you'd like to impart? We have touched on it. And I was, uh, you know, it comes back to that, that first question, actually. The technician brand is yes. going to be launched next year. And part of that is actually, of course, it's post-apprentice. It's what you go on to, how, what, you, what more can you aspire to. And, and really getting out there, and a lot of it on social media, the interest in these jobs, the excitement in these jobs, the fact you interact with lots of really interesting people, and how well paid they are, and how secure they are. Mm. Key bits of information as people make their choices. Because it's really that technician level that we're so sadly lacking. Oh, it's isn't huge. It? The yeah. stats in this country. And of course, that's where the wealth creators of the future are going to be. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, Christine, in your experience, which countries produce work ready young people and which don't? And which, look, sorry. Which, which countries, in your experience, produce work ready people and which don't, in your experience oh, of travelling around the world? Oh, gosh. Um, I, I think that's very difficult. I think. Um, I have to say, I think India is pretty well up there. I think their, their, their educational system is, is superb in terms of the calibre of people. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm slightly biased because we're a third of our, of our workforce yes. there, but I would say it's pretty strong. So India to you. Anybody else leading the way around the world? Maybe in Europe, 
your sort of impression of the likes of Switzerland, Germany. We're going to be covering this more later I'm on as well. Probably not best place, to, best place, but I certainly know that the UK at the moment is is, is lagging behind, and we need to catch up. Yeah, as Vince mentioned in in those figures as well. And um, good luck, obviously, with Cap Gemini. It's great to hear that what traditionally the professional services you thought we were the last people to adopt that real work inspiring approach. So Thank it's you. given me great pleasure to hear that this morning as well. And and Francis, um, just really those challenges to ensuring employers invest in young people's skills. Obviously, you're critically important. Trade Union Congress, as a representative of those people, especially in those low-paid jobs and those hard-to-reach people out there as well. But just to get that brand of the trade union so people come to you in the future. Just some final thoughts there of what you well, can offer. Absolutely, and I think we've got lots and lots of positive case studies, some of them uh, that we've heard from today, where employers and unions are working together with the common cause of raising skills in a business and improving business productivity. But I think there is a bigger problem here. You know, austerity isn't working. Yeah. Uh, we, I think we're facing actually a very difficult period ahead in terms of our economy. Uh, spending cuts, unemployment up, demand down. Um, and it's, it's I'm afraid if we carry on the same course, it's going to get more difficult. What we really need to tackle is investment. Investment is too low in Britain, has been for a long time. This isn't a party political point. But in recent years, it's also been skewed towards finance and property, which are the two areas where inequality is worse and that aren't generating the kind of technician decent jobs that we all want to see. So we need to get that investment right. We need to invest in our infrastructure, uh, national grid, huge challenges ahead, uh, uh, electric cars, um, and of course, Crossrail, absolutely mm. key. But we need more of that in order to generate the decent jobs and critically the apprenticeships for our, that our young people so desperately need and that businesses rely on. I'm going to ask the panellists to remain seating, and we have a small gift for them um, appearing today. You have your own very medallion of excellence. I think we've got a little medal for you, which is going to be handed onto the stage now. So, as I say thank you, please give a round of applause to Francis O'Grady, TUC Deputy General Secretary, Christine Hodgson, Chairman of Cap Gemini UK, Steve Holliday, CEO of National Grid, Terry Morgan, CBE, Chairman of Crossrail. We've heard from Nick Bradley, the Group Director from City and Guilds, Christine Gaskell, Member of the Board for Personnel from Bentley, and of course, Peter Rogers, advisor to the Mayor's Office for Regeneration, Growth and Enterprise in the Greater London Authority. I hope you enjoy your very small gift as a reminder and memento of today. I just want to thank you very much for your support, for coming along, for your excellent contributions. To you, the audience, for being a fantastic audience, we have a slight break now, 15 minutes to turn around the room, and then you're back in here for lunch. And then we look from a global perspective this afternoon. Hope you can join me then at 1 o'clock. But in the meantime, thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.